You know, I had thought about doing like a like a 70s makeup for this since this story happened in the 70s, but I have somehow wandered into the 80s. Are you too close to me? Very chinny, but that's just that's my charm. Hi guys, welcome back. In today's video, we are doing another crew time. Crew time. Crew time. It's crew time. This is the story of the Freeway Phantom. Okay, so um, I just wanted to talk to anybody who might be new around here. So what we are doing is I'm putting on makeup and I'm telling a, a, a true crime story, which I call crew crime. Does it go together? We've already established that yes, it does, because you're just watching me put on makeup and then you're listening to a story that's very interesting. If you're not into true crime, then I'll catch you next week. If you just want to watch me put on the makeup, but like the crime is too gruesome for you, you can just, you can watch me on mute, listen to James Taylor, listen to Billie Eilish, whatever suits your fancy, whatever tickles your pickle. Also, when I'm talking about these stories, I am not making light of the crime. These stories are stories of literally the worst thing that can happen to a person and I appreciate that and I understand that. What I will make fun of is the criminals. I don't really talk about the makeup as I'm putting it on, but if you are curious, everything is gonna be listed down in the description box. So just check down there if you know, you're know you interested to see what I'm using today. The year was 1971, the place, Washington DC. The soft and natural look was the most popular, but guess what, we're not doing that today. <laughs> so over 16 months, beginning in the spring of 1971, six young black girls were all murdered in the Washington DC metro area. The girls ranged in age from 10 to 18. All of them had been sexually assaulted, one had been stabbed, and all of them had been strangled. They had all been dumped near uh, local highways and the murder spree gripped the city. The murderer, the freeway phantom, was never caught. The first girl to disappear was 13 year old Carol Spinks. She was one of eight children, including an identical twin sister. And on the evening of April 25th, 1971, the Spinks children were home alone. Their single mom, Alan Teen, was um, visiting her sister on the other side of town. Alan Teen kept a strict curfew, especially when she wasn't home. She would say, stay in the house and you don't answer the door if Jesus Christ knocks on it. Smart lady, Alantine. So while she was gone, one of the older siblings who did not live there anymore, she was just either lived nearby or was visiting. Uh, it's kind of unclear to me. Uh, she knocked on the door, they opened it. Naughty, naughty girls. <laughs> but she was asking one of the kids to run an errand for her to go to the store, pick up some groceries. So Carol relented, even though she knew that was totally against the rules because the sister was promising, you know, that she could pick herself up a drink, a treat. So she walked the seven blocks to the 7-Eleven near the family's home on Waller Place Southeast. This was in Congress Heights. So while Carol was out on this errand, she actually ran into her mom who was not happy. So Alantine confronted little Carol and then she explained, I'm running an errand for the sister. And she's like, okay, well you go on ahead and run that errand and I will see you at home young lady. And Carol went on her way to 7-Eleven. She made it to the store. You know, some time passed and the sister who had come to the house to send Carol on this errand popped back over the house wondering, where's Carol? And she wasn't back yet. When Alan Teen returned back to the house, Carol still wasn't back home. So they all went out into the neighborhood looking for her. They're knocking on neighbors' doors and Alan Teen really didn't waste any time. She called the police to report her missing. The girl was 13 years old. When when Alantine called the police, they told her, well, your daughter must have just ran away. Rude. So six days later on May 1st, 1971, the bruised and strangled body of Carol Spinks was discovered. She was lying off of an embankment near the rear of St. Elizabeth's Hospital on Suitland Parkway. According to the coroner's report, Carol had suffered injuries to her face, neck, and hands. So, defensive wounds. She had been raped and strangled and had undigested food in her stomach, some citrus fruit. DC Metro Police determined that over the six days that Carol was missing, she was alive for some of that time because somebody had fed her 
that fruit. The family had um, confirmed that they had not eaten any fruit. They didn't have any fruit in the house. So Metro Police Department scoured the neighborhood, hoping to find who had taken Carol, and a neighborhood witness had reported that they saw Carol carrying that grocery bag and walking back towards the Sphinx's home, which indicates that she had been abducted very close to home. Police aimed to investigate every lead, but you know, that quickly proved to be impossible. Okay, so remember the year is 1971 and we're in Washington DC. And during that time, the city was just filled with protest, rallies, sit-ins, walkouts, all kinds of demonstrations. For two weeks um, around the exact time of this, the murders, it was a really intense period of all of these anti-Vietnam War demonstrations. So starting that May, the city was overrun with thousands, thousands of people. And there were rallies and protests being held everywhere. May 1st, the day that Carol's body was found, was May Day. There was a major demonstration that had attracted 35,000 protesters to Washington, D.C. They were all in the National Mall. And then on the second day, police started moving through and trying to break it up. And they all regrouped at like nearby universities and parks and such. But they effectively gridlocked this city. I mean, it was taken over. And then by the third day, they called in the National Guard, okay? There was like 10,000 federal troops called into the city. They descended on the protesters using tear gas and pepper spray. And by the end of it, there was more than 7,000 arrests made. That's the largest mass arrest in US history. So the city's jails were filled to capacity. There was so many protesters that they were making like pop-up detention facilities. Makeshift detainee camps were set up and all available police officers were called in. It was like an emergency, right? They were called in to manage the situation, this emergency, and it effectively stopped all the other investigations, including the abduction and murder of Carol Spinks. Okay, so cut to only two months after Carol disappeared, another girl from the same neighborhood disappeared. 16 year old Darlenia Johnson, she lived on Wheeler Road Southeast. It's literally like just a few streets over. She left one morning for work at the local rec center. Remember it's the summertime and they were holding an overnight sleepover for the kids. So her mom was not expecting her home that night. She never made it there. The next day, she was reported missing by her mother. Her mother's name was Helen. And over the next two weeks, Helen started receiving weird phone calls. So these weird phone calls would be like silence on the line, breathing. And then in one call, a man's voice said, I killed your daughter. Eek! Helen reported all this to the police, of course, but they were unable to trace the call because it was 1971. <laughs> okay, tech was low. Now, cut to July 9th, 1971. Okay, so the body was discovered on July 9th, but actually two weeks before that, a body was reported to police and police went out to investigate it. Um, they drove by and didn't get out of their cruisers. And they said, oh, we can't find it. Nobody, nobody here. What? Okay, fine, whatever. So the person actually who had reported that body followed up went back to the area and saw the body and was like, hello, the body's still here. There's a body. That body had laid there for two weeks in the July sun. <laughs> so it had appeared to have been lying there for, you know, two weeks. And um, it was obviously badly decomposed from laying in the hot July sun. Facial recognition of this poor body was impossible. They reviewed um, recent missing persons reports and you know, fingerprints and all of those things. And they identified that body to be Darlenia Johnson. So because that her body was so badly decomposed, the medical examiner could not determine a cause of death, but police determined it to be linked to the Carol Spinks crime because Darlenia's body was found 15 feet from where they found Carol's body. So the families believed that the mostly white police force 
was not giving these crimes their full attention because the victims were black. Even though the population of DC at that time was like 70% black, these crimes happened two years within Martin Luther King Jr. being assassinated. Racial inequality and unrest was at a, like a full boil. Segregation, discrimination, all of that still really plagued this area because it was like that everywhere. So the lack of media coverage was also heavily criticized, um, saying that if these missing and murdered girls had been blonde and blue-eyed, they would have been on the front page of the papers, they would have been the leading story on the news. I mean, where's the lie? I mean, it's just really unfortunate, you know? Okay, so eight days after Darlenia's body was discovered, another young girl was missing. It was on the opposite side of the city. This was a 10 year old girl named Brenda. 10 year old Brenda Crockett was sent on a quick errand by her mother a block away. And after more time had passed than it would have taken her to run this errand, her mom went looking for her. And while Brenda's mom was out looking for her, Brenda called their house. Now remember, okay, this is 1971. This is not a cell phone call. Okay, so she was like on a pay phone or in a business or maybe a home, very strange. So when Brenda called the house, her seven-year-old sister, Bertha, was the one who took the call. Brenda was crying on the phone and told Bertha that a white man had taken her and that she was in Virginia and that he was gonna put her in a cab and send her home. Okay, so for context, if you did not know a little bit of geography, Washington DC, when you look at it on a map, looks like a square that's like this, like a diamond. And all of this top part is Maryland and the bottom part is Virginia. So you can be in DC and then in Maryland in like five minutes or in Virginia in five minutes. It's all very close. That call dropped and then Brenda called back again. And this time it was her mother's boyfriend who answered the phone and spoke to Brenda. Brenda was crying, of course. And she asked, did, did my mother see me? And the mother's boyfriend was, you know, conf confused. <laughs> he was very confused. And he said, how's she supposed to see you? You said you're in Virginia. And then she said, well, I'll see ya. And then hung up. So they, of course, reported that incident to police straight away. By the next morning, the body of Brenda, 10-year-old Brenda, was found just over the Washington DC line near the Baltimore Washington Parkway. She had been raped and strangled and had a scarf knotted around her neck. So police suspected that that call from Brenda was at the direction of whoever had taken her. It was such an odd description on that call that they thought that that killer thought that he had been seen by Brenda's mother because he had Brenda ask, did mom see me? Further, they, the police thought that the bit about saying that she was in Virginia and that she was with a white man was definitely meant to throw off the police, you know, indicating kind of that whoever had taken her was probably not in Virginia and also probably you know, not a, a white guy. So again, the police could not trace those phone calls because, you know, 1971. I don't know how I feel about this makeup. It's not really turning out the way I want it to. Guess we'll see. Hi guys, don't be alarmed. This is editing me. When I was reviewing my footage and putting this together, I discovered that my memory card ate some of the footage not all of it, just bits and pieces. Love that for me, love that journey for me, it's great. Anyway, so I'm just gonna jump in now, fill in the blanks of the story. Sorry that this is a little bit disjointed, but here we are. So where were we? Okay, okay. On October 1st, another young girl was taken in Northeast Washington, DC. This time, it was 12-year-old Nenomoshia Yates. She was sent on an errand by her father to walk one block to a Safeway supermarket to pick up a couple of items. So she was seen leaving the store with the items, but she never made it home. And, you know, being so young, they were looking for her immediately and they found the bag of groceries. It was found strewn in the street. Within four Four hours her body was discovered off of Pennsylvania Avenue Southeast she had been raped and strangled so with four murdered young black girls in Washington DC in 1971 that close together the DC neighborhoods were spun up with equal parts terror and rightly so outrage 
Local news reporters seemed to share more information than the police did. And the response to the murders was, you know, frustratingly hopeless. At any rate, the community definitely agreed that they were connected. The police weren't any closer to solving it. There is fallout all over my nose. So after the fourth victim was found, the media named this killer and they named him the Freeway Phantom. This was Washington DC's first serial killer. So it was at this point that Metro PD started to look at these crimes collectively and they also enlisted the assistance of the FBI. Okay, now cut to November 1971. 18 year old Brenda Woodard is having dinner with a friend at landmark restaurant Ben's Chili Bowl on U Street, Northwest Washington DC. This was after she, she was taking some kind of night class at a school nearby. So after eating, she and her friend decided to catch the bus to go home. So Brenda got off at a bus stop at 8th and H Street Northeast because she had to switch lines to continue on her journey home. And that is where she is last seen alive. I don't know what I'm doing, but this is what we're doing. So by 5 a.m. the next day, Brenda's body. Hey, me again. <laughs> me again. All right. So Brenda was discovered on like on an on ramp or like near the on ramp to Baltimore Washington Parkway. She also had been raped and strangled, but she had also been stabbed six times. The coat that she was wearing was found draped over her and inside the pocket of the coat was a note. So the note was handwritten and it read, quote, this is tantamount to my insensitivity to people, especially women. I will admit the others when you catch me, if you can. Freeway Phantom. Okay, so he's leaving notes. Great, awesome. The city was terrified. And at this point they had set up a phone in tip line and the tip line exploded. So in order to help narrow down some of those suspects, investigators did handwriting analysis of that note. And they discovered that that note was actually written by Brenda. Obviously it was dictated to her by whoever killed her. The analysis of Brenda's handwriting interestingly revealed that she did not write that note under duress. Like her handwriting was not stressed or messy or shaky or scared seeming. So that tells investigators that whoever told her to write that note and whoever killed her, she probably knew them. All right, so with five dead girls, no witnesses, no real leads and no suspects, the murders suddenly stopped. So with the FBI's involvement and increased media scrutiny, it's kind of assumed that the killer maybe got a little scared and took a break, but it did not last long because nearly a year later on September 5th, 1972, the body of Diane Williams was discovered off of an on-ramp on I-295 South. Diane had visited her boyfriend's house in Southeast Washington, DC. And then at about 11.30 PM that night, she boarded a city bus. And by the next day, her body was found. So the FBI compared all the evidence among all of the victims, now numbering six known victims, and they had found a common thread, literally. All of the victims, except for Darlenia Johnson, because she was so decomposed, all of the victims had green synthetic fibers found on them. And these were the kind of fibers that would have been found in like that weird, gross 70s carpet in cars. Doesn't that remind you of Mindhunter? Like the Atlanta murder? You know, you know what I'm talking about? So it's 1972. There's a lot going on in the nation's capital, including the Watergate scandal. So you can, you can guess what their attention turned to. Are these lashes ridiculous? Yes, I'm aware. Next. All right, so cut to 1974. It's been two years since the last victim was discovered and a jailhouse snitch at Lorton Prison in Virginia told police that he had new information that could lead to solving the freeway phantom case. Of course, he wanted to collect the reward money and be released from prison. Guess what he was in prison for? Rape. His name was Morris Warren and he first denied any real knowledge, wasn't really sharing any information until he thought that police were gonna give him what he wanted. Wow, that's too much, too much, oh God. So he shared details about a group that police had called the Green Vega Rapist. And this was a group of rapists who were abducting and raping women in the DC metro area 
like gangbusters all around that time. And they had combined there was five members and they claimed responsibility for like over a thousand cases. Ah, so he claimed to know details of the murders and where the bodies were dumped. The police took Morris to the dump sites for two of the Freeway Phantom. Victims Darlenia, which was number two, the super decomposed one, and Brenda Woodard, who was number five. So while the discovery sites were correct, the crime details for each were inaccurate or confused. Well, police were getting a little bit suspicious, thinking that he was definitely like playing them, you know, because of course. When they were on the way back from one of the visits with Morris, he heard on the radio that um, you know, media was reporting that new details had come forward in the Freeway Phantom case from someone in Lorton Prison. So, you know, of course he was like, okay, well, I'm done talking to y'all. I'm gonna get murdered. <laughs> Anyways, he stopped cooperating with police and then he actually later admitted that he was totes lying. He was lying because he was trying to get a reduced sentence and all of the details that he had shared with police were things that had been made public, so. It was also discovered that the green Vega, Vega is a model of an automobile from around that time. And Morris was telling police, you know, that they were going around snatching up girls in that car, but that car wasn't even manufactured until after the first body was discovered, Carol Spinks. So, okay, none of it jived, he was lying. So detectives also compared case details with other known predators and they started looking closer at a suspect named Robert Askins. So he had a long history of rape, kidnapping, murder. He had previously been hospitalized at St. Elizabeth's Mental Institution. He had been released on a legal technicality. Love those. But anyway, so similar to the Brenda Crockett, I'm in Virginia with a white man misdirect, he would use those same tactics with his victims. When police and investigators were interviewing his known associates, that this Robert Askins used the word tantamount in like regular conversation. That's weird. Nobody says that, tantamount. Remember the note? Anyways, well, they exacted a search warrant. They went to his home. They found a ton of weird stuff, but they didn't find anything that was gonna connect him to any of the freeway phantom victims. So he ended up going to prison for other things that they found in his house, but police could not connect him to the crime. So with no suspects or leads, the case ran cold. During the span of the killings, like I said, the Watergate scandal happened and um, its following actions had the nation's attention. It forced the Freeway Phantom case far well into the background and it attracted little interest from the public outside of the neighborhoods where these victims lived. So in 1972, it seems that the killings stopped, which let's be honest, the person responsible probably got arrested for something else. Good. But anyways, the killings stopped but the families, they have no closure. The investigators are haunted by failure of this investigation and the reputation of the DC Police Department was pretty tarnished in this process. So in 1987, Detective Romaine Jenkins, who was one of the first homicide detectives that was working this case from day one, she was promoted to sergeant and with that promotion was in a position of leadership and authority to focus resources from the police department back on this case and try to get it solved. So when she dug back into the case, she discovered that all of the physical evidence and the entire case file were destroyed. <coughs> Makes you sick. Makes you sick. She reached out to the other state law enforcement offices and to the FBI to try to recreate these files as best as possible using the photographs and whatever it is that they had, the reports, notes, case files from the detectives work in this case. She did a pretty good job, but without any of the physical evidence, I mean, the case is just really unlikely to be solved. So the sister of Diane Williams named Patricia spent 26 years with Metro PD. She was so inspired to do something and spent her life trying to solve this case or work towards solving this case in cases like this for other families. And she did a lot of great work, but she moved on. She became a case manager with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and she eventually retired. In 2004, DC police detective Jim Trainum of the Violent Crime Case Review Project started working on this case. 
specifically the case file for Diane Williams. She was the one who was found over the line in Maryland in Prince George's County. So when Diane's body was discovered and the evidence was collected, they had found a hair inside her mouth. So Detective Trainum submitted that hair um, as DNA evidence. It's the only DNA evidence in the entire case that was collected. But some later interviews with Detective Trainum, who is now retired, said that they, it went nowhere. It went nowhere, nothing happened with it. God, frustrating. So you guys might remember a really fun video that I did about a year ago with my friends Lisa and Kathy. I'll link it right here. Kathy is a DC native. She's sweet as pie, I love her. When I was collecting my information for this case, I was thinking, oh my gosh, I need to talk to Kathy. She is a DC native. I wonder if she's gonna have some little nuggets to share in. <laughs> Hold on to your butts. Hey, La Sarah, this is Kathy. I um did have a little story, did have a little incident. I was on the way to work and it was pouring down rain and I was driving my hoopty. And when I got on the um, 295 by Bolin Air Force Base, it was no visibility. So I pulled over was just gonna wait until things died down. And as I pulled over, a guy in a white older station wagon pulled over too behind me. He can't, got out of the car, now it's pouring down rain, and I remember he had a white t-shirt on, not a wife beater, but a regular white t-shirt. And um, I kinda cracked my window, and he was like, is there, you got a problem, anything going wrong? And I said, I said, oh yeah, my windshield wipers aren't working, and so I'm just gonna wait until the rain dies down. So he says, oh, I have something in my car that I can uh, fix it with. So, so I was like, okay. So he goes to his car, and you know, I'm looking in my rear view mirror to see what he's getting. I couldn't see what it was, and he wrapped the towel around it. I was like, oh, heck no. <laughs> he's coming toward the car and I never cut the car off so I put it in drive and I put the pedal to the metal I just drove off but I just did not feel comfortable with what he did and as I look back in the rearview mirror he was pissed and that even confirmed to me that I did the right thing so the moral to that story ladies and gentlemen, if your gut tells you something ain't right, you better put the pedal to the metal. Glad I could contribute to the uh, freeway phantom type stories in Washington, D.C. I've been in Washington, D.C. since I was six years old by way of High Point, North Carolina. So I'm a city girl with a southern heart. All right, Sarah. See you soon. Love you. Bye. First of all, Bravo, Kathy. Always trust your gut. Ladies, this is a perfect example of fuck politeness. Okay, Kathy pulled over. Someone, a nice person pulled over to help. He creeped her out. She was like, gone, out of here. Listen to your guts. Listen to your guts. So most criminal cases are solved within the first 48 hours, and this case has been open for nearly 48 years. So according to an article that I found Prince George's County, Maryland police are still actively investigating this case and there is a tip line. So if you have any information, I will list the phone number of the tip line down below. The reward of $150,000 is still active. So if you can help, please do help. So that was the super frustrating, sad, and spooky story of the Freeway Phantom. Thank you again to my beautiful friend, Kathy, for sharing that personal anecdote related to the story. It's chilling to hear that. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you wanna see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this YouTube channel. I upload new videos here on YouTube every Thursday. You can also follow me on some of the other social channels. Everything's right here on the screen. Hit the notification bell down below. Is it on that side? Is it on that? I don't know. Anymore. That is it for now. I will catch you next week in next week's video. Bye! Per Patricia. Why can't I say Patricia? Patricia. Oh, this is not going to work out at all, is it? They were called in to manage this to... Whoa. Okay. I really went in there. Damn it! Bart! That looks terrible. Fallout! Oops, sorry, my
microphone. So that was the super, Jesus, excuse me while I freak out. I think that's it.